our CFD, um, he handles our CFD division. So any CFD studies, uh, airflow, uh, engineering that you would need, Gordon is the guy. Um, he is, uh, in my opinion, one of the best to do it. Um, and so I'm, I'm glad that he's gonna be giving this presentation because I don't know anybody better to be able to do it. So uh, if you do have questions, uh, he will be able to answer those today. He can hear us. Um, and he just can't see you because I don't have my computer turned, but he can hear you. Um, so anyway, without further ado, Gordon, if you want to take off, I'll mute you on my end so you don't get an echo. Great. Thank you so much, Royce. And thank you everybody for having me today. Uh, I was looking forward to actually being in person uh, for the past few months. Uh, for this, I've heard there's some really good barbecue there too that I'll be missing, but Royce, hopefully uh, I'll be out there sometime in the near future. As Royce brought out, we have a exciting topic today, containment, consumption, and sustainability. My name is Gordon Johnson. I'm the Senior CFD Manager with Sub-Zero Engineering. I'm also a CDCDP, Certified Data Center Design Professional, a DSEP with the Department of Energy, and I have a Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering from New Jersey Institute of Technology. I'd like to bring up one little sports note before I begin. I know uh, Royce mentioned uh, I'm deep in the heart of uh, Texas Longhorn country, and I know you've got a great football program, a very good basketball program. Uh, NJIT does hold a division record uh, that you don't have. Uh, no, we've never made the basketball tournament. We've never made the final four. Um, but our record is we have the most consecutive losses of any school in Division One basketball history. So I have to get that out of the way. That's the, you know, the records are record. So I just bring that out. Now I'd like to get into the discussion. Uh, two questions I'm going to be covering today. Uh, in a data center, data center operator, whoever we are, what can we do immediately to reduce our PUE, our power usage effectiveness, while increasing our efficiency and also not sacrificing the reliability of our IT equipment. So that's question number one we're going to discuss today. The second thing is we're all getting more and more concerned about uh, leaving the smallest carbon footprint we possibly can. So how can we meet our sustainability goals? Maybe we want to reduce our carbon footprint by 5-10%. Uh, we want to call ourselves green. We want to be more sustainable. Uh, what can we do to uh, help achieve those goals? And the answer is, it's going to be containment, and we'll see why that's the case throughout this demonstration today. And one little thing I'll kind of get out of the way is putting in containment in a data center uh, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to save the money that I'm about to talk about over the next hour. Uh, and the reason for that, and on very, very rare occasions, uh, we've done full containment projects. I've gone back a year or two later to do a CFD on their data center, um, and those data centers haven't saved the pin. And again, on a very rare occasion, um, what containment allows you to do is to do something called cooling optimization in your data center. Now, every now and then, we get a customer that, even after containment, says, I don't want to raise temperatures. I don't want to lower fan speeds. I like things ice cold just the way they are. And we can't change that. But for 99% or percent or more people, after putting in containment, now you're going to be what's able to do what's called room level airflow management. Or again, I'll shorten that to cooling optimization. Now we'll see why that's the case. What is containment? Um, in its simplest form, Containment is separating your cold supply air from your hot return air. Uh, we only want one thing to happen in your data center. We want your IT equipment to get cold supply air, and we want that exhaust air from those racks to go nowhere else except back to the cooling unit, maybe a crack for an in-row cooler or whatever it is. That's where we want that hot air to go. We want to prevent that cold supply air and that hot exhaust air from mixing. And we can do that from employing or deploying either cold aisle containment, hot aisle containment. Um, in a few rare cases, we even do a hybrid design, which is a combination of both. Now we'll get up into that uh, a little bit more in just a second. The other thing I'm going to mention uh, throughout this 
presentation. And, and please don't get worried as uh, you see the first couple of slides. There's a lot of bullet points. Um, I'm not going to read these bullet points. I may at most read just one bullet point per slide. Uh, there's been a lot of time and research put into this. I'm constantly updating uh, my numbers, my figures, the research involved. Uh, and this will also be available via PDF from Reuters afterwards. Again, you don't want me reading this slide. Maybe we'll just read one point from each slide just so we can get through it. And again, you'll have all this information later on uh, if you'd like to have it. Again, is containment necessary? I thought this third bullet point uh, down from the top, and I just got this updated number from Google at the uh, DCD virtual event back in April of this year. They said there's been a 550% increase in the amount of computing done in data centers uh, around the world from 2010 to 2018. And then getting away from their numbers, I'm just going to throw out some catchphrases at you. Uh, AI, HPC, edge data centers, the cloud, bigger data centers, smaller, more compact data centers, blade servers, micro servers, uh, etc. Today, it's not uncommon to go to a data center and see the average KW per rack. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, it was 2, 3 KW, maybe it maxed out at 5 KW. Today, uh, seeing a, a whole pot of 15 KW racks, that's very common to see. Uh, Vertif made this prediction. They said by the year 2025, and again, it's just a prediction, uh, they're saying don't be surprised to see 52 KW per rack. So the whole point is, is containment necessary? Do we have to, uh, do we have to separate that cold supply uh, from the hot exhaust air? Well, data center energy consumption is definitely not going away. So containment's going to be, is not only essential now, but you'll see in just a minute, it's going to be more and more so that's going to be the case in the future. Again, a lot of bullet points, uh, benefits of containment. The one that I want to really look at, of course, the bottom one, the easiest, we say the easiest way to save money is with containment, but the only one I'm going to focus in on is the third one down. Uh, here's my goal in every data center, whether it be CFD studies or, of course, putting in hot or cold out containment. I want to see an acceptable supply across your IT intake. And what I mean by that is, I should be able to go down your cold aisle in the data center, and if I measure at the bottom of the rack, the middle of the rack, or the top of the rack, I don't want to see a temperature change. If I see 70 degrees coming from your perf tile, I want to see 70 degrees at the bottom. I want to see 70, 71 in the middle, and maybe 71 at the most, 72 at the top. Now, if I walk down to the other end of your cold aisle, I don't want to see a change. I want to see that one, two degree, maybe maximum three, but I want to see a very small delta anywhere in your cold aisles that I walk in your data center. Um, once I've achieved that, and only after I've achieved that, then I can go back and do what we mentioned at the beginning, and that's that cooling optimization in your data center. And again, what is cooling optimization? Um, the first thing is it's raising the supply air temperatures of your cooling units. I want to get them as high as possible to still have your IT uh, equipment running at a safe temperature. We'll talk about what that highest possible number is in just a moment. The other thing that falls under the definition of cooling optimization, I want to match the cooling capacity, that's the airflow and CFM that I'm providing to you, with the IT cooling demand. For instance, if your IT equipment says, my fans demand uh, 50,000 CFM, well, that's great. I don't want to give you 100,000 CFM. I don't want to give you more. I want to match that 50,000 demand with as close to possible 50,000. I'm going to go a little bit higher, but I just want to get higher supply versus the demand. That's what the definition is of cooling optimization. Those two things is where you're going to save a lot of money in a data center. Some additional benefits of containment. Again, I don't want to uh, read things. I'm just going to read one point, the third one down. Uh, and this is important to know. It says, according to Data Center Knowledge's Energy Efficiency Guide, 
can say, containing can save a data center approximately 30% of its annual utility bill without additional capex. Now, some people might say, well, isn't installing uh, containment uh, additional capex? We will, I'm not gonna argue that yes or no, but um, what we typically see is that number 30% it's not unusual for us to hit 25 to 28 percent uh, savings. It's not unusual for us to see uh, 10 months to maybe 14 or 15 months before uh, a customer gets his ROI. So data center containment can save you a lot of money once you've recouped your ROI. And most people would say, you know, if I make my uh, money back in two years or less, I'm happy. We see that as a lot less typically. But again, once you make that back, then the savings is just money in the bank. And we'll talk about what those savings are and how we can calculate them. Last little point, I will read it. I like to, my little catchphrase, the best energy saved is the energy you don't consume in the first place. And again, that's our goal, is to knock down your energy consumption in your data center. Before we go any further, I'm going to use a lot of expressions through this, uh, and I just wanted to take a few minutes just to go over them. I, I apologize if this is a review for some. Um, if it is, we'll go through it very quickly. But these are things that just in this conversation or just when talking about data centers, the next three slides, um, you really have to have a, a, at least a basic understanding uh, to understand how we can save money in the long run. The first one is power usage effectiveness, or PUE. Now, PUE, uh, in its simplest form, um, is a measure of how energy efficient your data center is. Now, there's a lot of pros to using PUE. There's some cons to using it. Some people love it, some people hate it. So I won't debate uh, the good or the bad, but PUE's been around for a couple of years, and the reason is it's very simple to use. Uh, I will say, you know, it's simple to, uh, to cheat on the number. Uh, some people do it. Some people, you know, only do their measurements in the dead of winter. Uh, there's also other things that could make your PUE go up. Uh, you're really saving money. So, again, we'll take that out of the equation. Um, but PUE is nice because it does give you a quick look as to how energy efficient your data center is. And after you make changes, uh, hopefully, you'll see from the PUE that it's even more efficient. Uh, PUE is defined as, in the numerator down below, you take all the energy consumed in your data center by your cooling. So the craft units, your crawl units, uh, your chilled water plant, um, the power in your data center, your UPSs, your generators, uh, your lighting, and then finally, you add your IT heat load in KW. And you divide that, again, by your IT heat load in KW. So an energy efficient data center, um, a perfect data center would have a PUE of one, meaning the IT heat load, if it's, uh, say, one megawatt, then the energy consumed is one megawatt, and the newer grader is one megawatt, you'd have a perfect data center. You'd have no lighting, you'd have no UPSs, uh, you have free cooling going on all the year. The reality is most people don't see anything even close to that. But again, the goal is to get as close to 1.0 as possible when it comes to a PUE. When we look at existing legacy data centers, it's not uncommon for people to say my PUE is 2.0. And just so you can understand what that means, uh, if you have a PUE of 2.0, what that means is for every kW of heat that is being generated by your IT equipment, that means it takes another kW to get that heat back out of the room. So again, that would be the definition of a PUE equals 2. And a PUE of 2 is average, but it's not energy efficient. Um, I've seen, and I hate to say it was down in Texas, I think it was down in the Dallas area, they had a PUE of 6.3, and at first I didn't believe the number they gave me after doing a little more pre-research for a CFD. Uh, they were running their cooling units at 55. They had uh, almost seven times the amount of supply air versus the demand air, so yeah, they, they had a PUE of 6.3. But again, we want to get your PUE as low as possible. 
The next slide talks about ASHRAE air intake temperature guidelines. Again, it's a lot of information on this slide. Uh, I won't go through it all, except I do want to just explain very briefly the difference between recommended and allowable, and also the class type server. So that first number, recommended. What ASHRAE is saying, and this comes back to how high should you be running the temperature in your data set. ASHRAE says you can run 64.4 degrees as your low temperature, 80.6 degrees as your high temperature. Um, that is what all IT equipment, regardless of what class it is, A1 through A4, B or C, doesn't matter. Those are the recommended guidelines, and you're not going to have any issues with your equipment. Now, I will mention you can run lower than 64. You're still probably not going to have issues, but again, you're just throwing money out the window if you do that. So we're going to focus on that high number, 80.6. So they want you to raise the temperatures on your cooling units so that all of the equipment is running as close to 80.6 as possible. Now, a separate discussion, you might be saying, is there a sweet spot where um, it's okay to run it higher than that, but I'm not really saving any money. The industry typically says 77 degrees. Then all your fans start ramping up on your IT equipment. But again, just for a definition, let's not go above 80.6 as your intake for your servers. Now, what happens if you're running everything, you know, very efficient, maybe you're at 75, 76, and a crack goes down, or two cracks need to be serviced? Now we talk about the allowable temperature rate. And if you notice, it gets a little tricky here because there's different classes. Um, you have an A1 where you can go as high as 89.6. And if you look at that first column in red, A2, 95, A3, 104. Um, and you may say, well, you know, how would I ever know what class server I have? But the answer is it's not easy. Um, but I will say this, if you have a data center from the last five, six, seven years until now, you don't have A1 equipment in there. You have A2, maybe even A3 type servers. Uh, if you have a, a very old, you know, 10 year old data center, a lot of telecom equipment, uh, it's probably A1 type equipment. And that's important because that tells us how high the temperature can go at the intake to that equipment without us shortening the life of the equipment or losing our warranty. So for instance, if you have A2 type equipment, if a crack fails and you've got to fix that crack unit, that's not a big deal. If you go above 80.6, maybe you go to 88 degrees, uh, maybe you go to 92 degrees, it sounds bad. You're going to get a lot of alarms. You're not breaking your warranty. You're not shortening the life of your equipment you're in an allowable range. You just can't run your data center that way 24 seven. What we're saying is fix your problem, get your crack service, get it back and running, um, you know, run it that way for a day or two or whatever's necessary and get those temperatures back below 80.6. So again, that's the difference recommended. We want to be in that window allowable. We can go above uh, recommended into that window but we don't want to go above the uh, allowable range of 89.6 for A1, 95 degrees for A2, or perhaps 104 for the A3 type server. Now, the last thing I want to show before we get into an interesting case study is, here's how, well, I'm sorry, I had one more slide. And in fact, this is a really important slide. It looks a little cartoonish, but this comes from the Department of Energy uh, DCEPS training program. The thing that we want when we're putting in containment in your data center is we want that middle slot. This is defined as once through cooling. I want cold air to come up from the perf tile, uh, down from the uh, overhead ductwork or from the inlet cooler. And I only want it to do one thing. I want it to go into the inlet of your server. And out of your server exhaust, I don't want that air coming back into the inlets or going anywhere except directly back to the cooling unit. That's it. That's once through cooling. Um, and you'll hear a lot of people say, you know, hey, the hotter the air back 
being returned to your crack units. Um, the more cooling you'll get from the crack, that's true. The more efficient that crack will run. Those are all true. We won't get into that now, but I, I want those hot temperatures back at my crack. But again, focusing in on the IT equipment, I don't want anything but that temperature, that, that supply air temperature that I've set at my crack unit. That's the only air I want coming into the intake. The problem on the left, most people have net bypass air, and they always have bypass air if they don't have container. Bypass air is just like its definition. Uh, you have a heat load, uh, the air, some of it's going into your servers, a lot of it's bypassing. It's going through openings in the racks, it's going over the racks, and it's returning back to the crack returns, and it's returning as cold air, uh, so the cracks aren't running as efficiently as possible, and you're basically wasting air. Think of bypass air, uh, it costs money to cool the air, it costs money to blow the air, so you're wasting money. Uh, a little analogy I like to use with regard to a car air conditioner, uh, say you're driving down the highway on a, a very hot Texas day, you put your air condition on, but then you open all your windows in your car. Is it cooling you a little bit? Yeah, it's doing a little bit, but you're also blowing that air right past you, right out the window, wasted air. So bypass air, very expensive. It certainly raises people's PUE, uh, again, because you're wasting cold supply air. Net recirculation air on the right is just as bad because here's what gives you hot spots. Here's what causes ser server failures of IT alarms. Um, we want that cold air to come to the IT intake. What we don't want is that hot exhaust air to deviate from going back to the cracks. We don't want it to circulate above the top of the racks and back into the top equipment in the cold aisle. We don't want it to go around the end of the aisles and back into the first one or two racks at the edge of your cold eyes. That's net recirculation air. Again, it causes issues, uh, it causes alarms, it shortens the life of equipment in your data center. Another analogy, driving on that hot Texas day in your car, uh, you've got a car full of people, so what you do is you put your uh, air recirculation on. So you bring hot air from the outside, going around the car, it's air, it's moving, but it's hot air, and you don't put on your air condition. So what's happening? Are you getting air? Yes. Is it good air? Is it cold air? No, it's going to be very unpleasant in a couple of minutes. So that would be a little analogy of hot air recirculation. Uh, the next two slides kind of bring it home with some CFD modeling. Uh, the first slide, live video, you'll see air coming in a cold aisle, 62 degrees, uh, to supply air. Notice it's going into the racks, but notice the top of the racks. I've got 75 degree, 80 degree, and notice why. Hot air is circulating, you'll see around the end of the aisles, over the top of the racks, uh, and back into the cold aisles. Now, you might not be able to see it that well, but this data center has a translucent drop ceiling. So it's got ceiling rims. All that hot air should be going up into the ceiling, back to the cracks, and it does eventually a lot of it, but again, what's happening is the hot air is coming in the cold aisles, it's heating up your equipment. In addition, cold air is blowing, it, and it might be hard to see, but in the back of that main aisle, it's blowing right out of the cold aisle up into your drop ceiling. So you've got net recirculation air and also bypass air going on in the staff section. And we look at this, we may say, how can I fix this problem? Well. You can't lower your temperatures anymore, and you can throw more air at it, but here's a real quick solution. Let's put cold dial containment. Exact same temperatures, data specs. Notice in the cold dial, the cold air can't escape. It can't become bypass of air. It can't come up through the drop ceiling and return to the cracks. It's got one place to go. It can only go to your server inlets. Now look at the hot air coming from the exhaust. It tried to get around the end of the aisles. It tried to go over the top of the racks because hot air goes where it wants to go. But in this case, it gets rejected. So eventually it says, I've got nowhere to go, but eventually I'll make my way up through the ceiling grills and back to the returns on my cracks. Uh, this is a case where we spoke about earlier. At this point, 
I can now do some cooling optimization in the status set. I can raise temperatures. I might be able to lower fan speeds, but I definitely can save some money. One last thing before I continue, um, one common misconception with cold dial containment, which is what I'm showing here, is people say, you know, if I contain the cold dials, the rest of my data center is one big hot aisle. That's true. But people say, I don't want to walk into a hot aisle. I don't want to walk into a, a hot data center. And while that's true, we want to make your data center hot to walk into. And we're going to do that with cooling optimization. But the act of putting in containment, remember what I said earlier? It doesn't save you money unless you start doing that optimization. In fact, if you put in containment because you have hot spots, like shown in this slide, you solve your hot spots. In fact, if you look at your hot aisles, and it, you might have to think back about two or three minutes, before we had much hotter return temperatures in that data center. Now the temperatures are in the 80s. They're very consistent, and that's been coming through the exhaust on all your racks back to your drop ceilings. So I actually lowered the temperature throughout your data center, and the reason is we got rid of that, uh, hot a dead air in circulation. I'm no longer mixing cold air and hot air and pushing that through your server inlets. So that hotter temperature was causing hotter returns. Because I have consistent supply temperatures to the intakes of your servers, I have consistent return temperatures, which are, which are actually lower than when we started. Again, I want to raise them later to save money, but just to get rid of that misconception, when you put cold aisle containment, uh, if you do nothing else, what you're going to do is get rid of your hot spots and you'll have a cooler data center to some extent. Uh, however, we're going to try to change that in just a few moments. So that's the end of my metric discussion. Just a, another little side question before we get into a case study. And a lot of these questions are almost topics in themselves. Should I install cold aisle containment or hot aisle containment? Uh, we get that question quite a bit, and the answer is it depends. First, let's talk about cold aisle containment, and then we'll explain why that answer, it depends, is true. Um, again, looking just at that third bullet point, when you control, contain a cold aisle, the rest of the data center is basically one large hot aisle. And here's a few examples, whether it be roof systems, um, overhead cooling, pumping into the roof, Cold aisle containment can go all the way up to the ceiling, you know, hopefully, you know, if your ceiling's not too high. A lot of different ways to do cold aisle containment. But again, you've separated the cold supply air from the hot exhaust air. Hot aisle containment, by definition, when you contain the hot aisle, the rest of the data center is basically one large cold aisle. And you see a few examples. The first rate, the hot aisle, often depends on you having a return drop ceiling so we can push that air through that ceiling back to your cooling units. And you see a few examples uh, of rigid containment, uh, vinyl containment going up to a, a ceiling. Uh, the ceiling would be open over those hot aisles. That's how we get that air back. Finally, on the right, uh, I always like to bring out, uh, here's an example of hot aisle containment with a roof system. And that's because it's showing in-row coolers. Hot aisle containment works great with a, a data center. If you're thinking of doing in-row cooling, hot aisle containment's a great way to go. Cold aisle containment works just as well. So look at that first question in that bullet point. Which system should you deploy? It depends. So when we go into an existing data center and we say, oh, you know, hey, when the customer says, should I go hot or cold? 90% of the time, the choice is made for us just looking at the building themselves. For instance, uh, maybe it's a raised floor, there's no drop ceiling. Um, maybe there's a drop ceiling, but there's so many overhead constraints. I'm going to probably suggest cold aisle containment in that case. Uh, hot aisle containment, you've got a drop ceiling, it's not too high, it's easy to get the air back. Um, it's, it's plenum rated for a fire, et cetera. Hot aisle containment is going to be a great choice. Um, here's my point. From a thermodynamic standpoint, that second bullet point, it doesn't matter. Either type of containment is going to have similar results. 
because again, you're doing the same thing. You're separating your cold supply air from your hot exhaust air. You're able to raise your temperatures, very similar. You're able to either turn off uh, crack units, lower fan speeds. You're gonna have very similar results. Now, if you choose to do a lot of research on this, there's a lot of white papers on this topic. Um, you'll come away with that second bullet point. Um, you may come away with some statistics that show one type of containment saving a, a little bit more money than the other. That's kind of a separate topic. Uh, and that's because a lot has to do with uh, human preference, with temperatures. Like we said, a hot aisle containment, you're walking into a cold data center. Uh, the customer would say, you know what, oh, it's 75 or 72 when I walk in, I can go a tiny bit higher compared to the cold aisle containment. Maybe it's 90 when he walks in. He goes, I don't want to go any higher, uh, even though the server equipment's getting the exact same temperature. But again, just remember from a thermodynamic standpoint, either type has similar results. Um, you often don't have a choice what type you put in. Most new data centers, um, as they're being designed right now and built, are choosing to go with hot aisle containment. Most legacy data centers choose cold aisle containment simply because they don't have a choice. Let's look at a case study. And here's where I mentioned again, I'm going to kind of go through some of these numbers somewhat quickly. Um, you may say, you know, hey, I really want to understand better the math that you're doing, or I'd like to really look through those bullet points. Again, we have this whole presentation in PDF format. I would be glad to give it to you. So if I'm jumping around and going kind of quick, um, there's a lot of information. I don't want to bore you. I just kind of want to hit on some of the highlights. So let's look at a typical data center. It's not too big. It's 5,000 square feet. Uh, we only have 480 kW of heat load. And I've done this on, I just try. I could have chosen a 50,000 square foot, um, but it really would have just proven the same point with overwhelming you with a lot of data. So let's go kind of reasonably small. We've got eight CROI units, a, a CROI unit versus a craft instead of a computer room air condition, computer room air handler. Um, a CROI has chilled water coming into it, um, and they always have variable frequency or speed drives where I can reduce the airflow uh, to match the IT heat load. Although craft units are now uh, being designed that enable you to do the same thing. Uh, the CROI units, all eight are going to be running at a maximum CFM, like that fourth bullet point, 12,100 CFM. Um, I'm running at a very cold 62 degrees, so uh, I'm not energy efficient, and I'll show you why. Uh, here's kind of an interesting thing. I'm giving this data center 96,800 CFM. That last bullet point, and again, this is, again, another half hour, hour discussion, but so I won't deviate too much, but it says the demand of the IT is 74,000 CFM. Where did I get this number? Uh, the simplest answer is the CFD software makes certain assumptions, and that's how it comes up with the IT demand. Um, I can hard code that number in. I can put in my own uh, delta across the racks. I can put my own airflow number. It's typically easier to let the software calculate that. How does the software calculate that? Um, and this is something that it's good to get just this misconception out of our minds if we have it. Um, in the past, and even if you Google this after this meeting, if you say, how much CFM do I need to remove 1kW of heat? Unfortunately, the answer you're going to keep coming up with is 158K, uh, CFM. So a 5kW rack in your data center would be 5 times 158, whatever, 750 or somewhere around that. Uh, that was true 10 years ago. That's true in your telecom days. That's not true today. Now, if you're in an older data center and all the server racks are 2 to 3 kW, that's probably a fair number to go with. But if you really want to know what your CFM cooling demand is from your IT rack, it's that formula down below in blue. It's 3.16 times your server wattage divided by the delta T where the delta T represents the temperature rise of air through the server in Fahrenheit. So what does that mean? Well, you need to know, for instance, if you have a server, 
that delta T, it used to be 20 degrees 10 years ago. It's not 20 degrees today. It's 25 degrees, be 30. Uh, the latest blade surveys, it could be 40. To try to summarize that, the higher the delta, remember the newer servers have 30, 35, 40, the less airflow you need. So instead of 158 CFM for 1KW, um, if it's a brand new server, uh, a blade server, very energy efficient, uh, that delta T may be 80 degrees. So instead of 158, maybe you only need 79 CFM. Uh, so the CFD software can make calculations based on the heat load of that equipment. Um, if you don't know that delta T, and here's the next thing, um, do all equipment manufacturers provide that delta T? Unfortunately, no. Um, but it's not 20 degrees. You can go with, if you really want to be sure and conservative, you can go with 25, um, even maybe a little bit higher. I have a tool that I'm going to show you at the end of this presentation that's a free download I've created. If you're in this business of trying to calculate CFM for pods in your data center according to the heat load, I've automated it for you. And I'll show you where that tool is a little bit later on. Again, I could talk about this for an hour and really bore everybody probably, but I just wanted to mention that's where we get that cooling demand from. Let's look at the cost to estimate this data center. And this math is very accurate because there's not much to it. So if you say, well, you know, does this work for my data center? I, I can guarantee it does. If you know your IT heat load, and everyone does, uh, they can get that from uh, their PUE, uh, UPS units or um, their PDUs, but let's just say your heat load is 480 kW. Now, does everyone know their PUE? Not necessarily. But if you don't have containment, I'm going to guess that it's between 1.8 and 2.0. If you know that number, you have everything you need because you know how much you're spending on your electricity. You have an energy bill. So you also know how many hours there are in the year. So if you look at my final line, if you take your IT heat load, which was 480, multiply that by your PUE, so in this case, 960 times 10 cents a kilowatt hour times 8,760 hours in a year, that's the cost to operate the status center. And again, if you've provided me those numbers, if they're accurate, we can guarantee you're going to be within a thousand, couple thousand, you know, you're not going to be far off from the cost to operate your data center. Now, the other thing, I'll just mention, if you know your IT heat load, and you have your yearly energy bill in front of you, but you say, you know what, right now, Gordon, we don't have a means to measure PUE. We can figure the PUE out right from this slide. So you can just do a little backwards math. Um, you can solve for your PUE, and again, it's going to be very accurate as long as you have these other numbers. And we have a little tool at the end of this presentation, if you're interested, a free download that will do all this for you, too. Let's go to the data center that costs us about $840,000 a year to operate. Um, not too big, cold aisles, hot aisles. The blue you can see is the cold, the red on the racks is the hot. See the perf tiles down the aisles, uh, standard flow. Then I've got some high flow, kind of the uh, oval shape. They're in front of uh, higher KW racks, you know, very common. You see the cracks around the data center. Again, uh, natural convection, uh, the hot air exhausts from the back of the racks, goes to the top of the data center, and back into the crack racks, uh, crack exhausts, very, very common. Um, this data center initially has a drop ceiling, although we're not using it to start out with. So how is this data center operating with this 62 degree supply air temperature? Uh, and also I gave you the supply versus the uh, airflow versus the demand of the IT equipment. This slide kind of gives one quick summary, and then we're going to get into a lot easier way to look at this. Remember the two arrows on the left, we said we have 96,000 CFM supply. Our demand, we're estimating it at 74,000. Shoot over to the right, and that red arrow, here's our issue. I've got 14 racks above 8.6 degrees in this data center. 
And that shouldn't be the case, because the supply here is 62 degrees. I should not have overheating, but without containment, again, I'm wasting air, I have more air than I need, and hot air is coming around the top of the racks and around the edge of the cabinets. If you look on the slide, wherever you see the red dot, it's color-coded. Uh, the red dot represents servers that have temperatures above 80.6. The color is the highest temperature at any place on that, on that rack. So very common, again, you're going to see overheating at the end of the aisles, hot air recirculating is around the end like we saw in that video a moment again, and also in the middle too. You'll have the hot air coming over the top of the racks. Um, we'll use the expression licking the uh, first five or ten U, causing overheating there. So 14 racks above ASHRAE's recommended range. We don't like that because that's 24 7. Notice the note two racks have temperatures above ASHRAE's allowable range. That's not good. And here's my problem all of my CROI units are running at 100% fan speed. I guess I can lower the temperature from 62, maybe to 55. Uh, that's going to make my energy bill go that much higher. It's not going to solve all my problems. I could buy a couple extra crack units, maybe put one in the top middle, the bottom middle, um, additional capex, more money to run it. So those are some options. Containment's going to be a very quick money-saving option. But before I show you that, what happens when a crack fails? And I'm one slide ahead of myself. This is the six-foot horizontal plane with all the CROA units running. And I apologize. I say CROA crack interchangeably. That's not really true. But here's a look at all the CROA units, and they're all running right now. Notice the hot air at six feet. It's going around the edge of the cold aisles, into the cold aisles, and it's going over the top of the racks. Here's that delta that I spoke about early on. I mentioned I want a one, two, maybe a three degree delta. I don't want a 29 degree delta. Look at the bottom of that rack with the red arrow. 62 at the bottom from the perf, in the middle of the rack, mid 70s at the top of the rack, 91 degrees. Again, I cannot do any cooling optimization in the stack center. What happens when a CROA fails? Well, if you look in the upper right hand corner where that CROA has an X, I've turned that off, either it failed, I did some maintenance. Notice how much hotter my data center is. Instead of 14 racks, I have 30 racks that have inlet temperatures above ASHRAE's recommended range. I have nine racks outside of their allowable range. I'm in a lot of trouble in this data center right now. Well, let's add cold aisle containment and see how we fix things very quickly. Uh, if you look at the airflow model on the left, I've added cold aisle containment pods to the entire data center. Notice the hot air. You see the air streams returning uh, below the drop ceiling, but they're returning over the equipment back to the returns on the CROI units. Notice how consistent that temperature is. There's no 95, 100 degree temperature anymore. Now look at the right hand corner. By in the temperatures, they're all 62, 63 degrees in my data center. Look at my lower right hand corner, the six foot horizontal temperature plane. No hot air is getting into the cold aisles. I've separated the two. My cold aisles are cold, and basically the entire or the rest of my data center, it's one big hot aisle. Now, what happens if I decided to do hot aisle containment? Remember, I said I had a return plenum ceiling. So look on the left, there's a translucent hot aisle or return ceiling. I put ceiling grills in. I've now moved my containment from the cold to the hot aisle, open some tiles above the ceiling. All of the hot air comes up, over through the ceiling, back into extension hooks that have been placed on the CROI units. Over on the right-hand corner, my inlet temperatures, same as cold aisle containment, 60. 63 degrees, no matter where I go. Look at the horizontal temperature plane. Remember that definition of hot aisle containment? I've contained my hot aisles, so the rest of the data center now is one big cold aisle. But again, from a thermodynamic standpoint, both data centers have the same inlet temperatures. And that's all, really, when we look at a data center, that's all we care about 
is what is the temperature providing that we're providing to the inlet fans on our IT equipment. Same data center, we've got cold oil container. Let's go ahead and turn a CROA unit off. Remember before I did that, I had 30 servers fail, or not fail, I should uh, go above the recommended range, 14 above the allowable range. Well, look now, everything's still in the 60s. Uh, yeah, if you look down around that failed CROA unit because of the way that CROAs are spaced, uh, I no longer have a one or two degree delta. It went up five, six degrees until I fixed that core unit, but so what? It's running at 68, 67 instead of 62. I still have a very nice, cold, consistent data center to operate in. Let's try to raise some temperatures, and here's where we do our airflow optimization or our cooling optimization. Here's where we really start to save you money in the data center. Same data center, I turned all CROA units back on, so we're all running at 100% fan speed. I've taken my spy air temperature, which was 62, I've raised it to 72. Look on the left at my input temperatures. They're 72, they're 73 degrees, consistent across the board. The horizontal temperature plane, again, I've separated the cold supply, 72 degree air from the warmer exhaust air, um, yes, as you walk into this data center, it's going to be warmer. Again, that's okay. Our data center is operating very efficiently. We're doing what we want to do. We're providing air well below ASHRAE's recommended temperature range. How much money do we save by raising that temperature of 10 degrees in this data center? Well, the third bullet point we've already established, it costs $840,000 to operate this data center. The supply air temperature, if you increase it by 10 degrees, and there's a couple of rule of thumbs. Um, if you do a lot of research on this, and I don't fully agree with the number I'm about to give you, the industry says for every degree, not everybody, but some in the industry will say a majority, for every degree Fahrenheit you raise your temperature, they say you're gonna see a four to 5% savings on the overall cost, the total cost to operate your data center. Um, in doing this for nine years now with our company, I don't see four or five percent. I see approximately 1.6 percent as my typical average. Sometimes a little higher, sometimes, but 1.6 is conservative. It's a fair number. Um, another way to look at 1.6 is if you take 4% savings for every degree, but just look at the cooling of your data center. I'm going to make an assumption that the total cost to operate your data center, I should say the total cost of cooling is 40% versus the total cost to operate your data center, 4%, 40%, again, it breaks down to 1.6%. So that's the number I like to go with. And I'm not trying to get too crazy here with our math, but I like to say for, for every degree you raise your temperature, you should see 1.6 savings on the overall cost to operate your data center. It may be higher than that. We don't like to surprise people. I don't want to say you're going to save 300,000 and you only save 134,000. We want to make our customers happy. If they wind up saving more, that's fantastic. 840,000 times 10 degrees times 1.6. 6%, that says you're going to save $134,000 operating the status center. There's more good news. If that's the case, if you look at the bullet points in red, your new annual cost dropped to $706,000. Remember before our KW, our total facility energy was nine hundred sixty. dollars It's now dropped to eight hundred six, dollars And your PUE, which was 2.0, has now dropped to one7 well, we want to do better than that. We set our CROA units, all CROA units have variable frequency or variable speed drops. And please don't worry, I know there's a great lunch there. Uh, I'm coming down the uh, five minute home stretch right now. Uh, our CROA units have variable frequency drives. They're running at 100%. Let's knock those speeds down to 80%. So if you look on the left, you still have input temperature 72, 73, maybe 74. Uh, maybe getting to that delta of 375. That's very good. On the right, 
the horizontal temperature plane, the temperature is going back to your coolers now and even hotter. They're going to run more efficiently. They're going to give you more cooling. Um, and again, will that data center be a little bit warmer to walk into? It will be. However, let's see how much money we start saving by doing this. The slide might seem a little overwhelming uh, at first glance, but look down at the, at the bottom. The fan affinity law says the fan of pump power varies with the cube of the change in airflow. Very simply, I mentioned these core units when running at 100% speed, we're putting out 12,100 CFM, and that shows it from the spec sheet that's highlighted. We know their fan power at 100% fan speed is 7.5. However, if you take that maximum CFM, divide it by the CFM at 80%, which would be 9680, cube that number, solve for KW2, and I'm going to show you, we're going to make this much easier in just one minute. That says you're, instead of consuming 7.5 kW of power, it's only going to consume 3.84 kW. So by reducing the fan just by 20%, you save 50% of the cost to operate that fan. That's a huge savings. If you reduced it from 100 to 70%, just 30% reduction, you save 67% on the cost. So here, we only have eight core units, but if you look at that third line, if you take that savings in KW times the amount of cross times the cost of electricity, 10 cents a kilowatt hour, times the hours in a year, we just saved an additional $25,649. Now, some data centers have 40 or 50 core units. Uh, they're a lot bigger. They're consuming a lot more power at 100%, knocking them down to 70%. Uh, right off the bat, some data centers save $100,000 or even more by reducing that fan speed. Getting back to this data center, we have a new annual cost. We dropped it down from $840,000 to $680,000, highlighted, underlined. My new facility energy dropped to 777 kW. My new PUE is 1.6. If you look at that chart, I was an average 2.0 PUE data center, I'm bordering on an efficient data center at 1.5. Finally, in green, we mentioned we want to be more sustainable. How do we do reducing your carbon footprint? Well, we reduced our KW by 183 kilowatts. Uh, we know how many kilowatt hours we reduced. Uh, our CO reduction after containment over the course of one year was 1,507 tons. And how does that break down to uh, helping the environment? Well, the carbon offset reduction after containment, in this case, uh, per year, is 8,080 trees. Now, it's not just that you would have to plant over 8,000 trees. Those trees then would have to exist for 30 years, all 8,000 280 of them to offset that 183 kW that we just got rid of. Um, and again, 1,507 tons. So we did something really good for the environment. We did something really good for our pocketbook. Uh, we saved a lot of money. We just made our data center very efficient. Uh, this was a simple case study, but it doesn't matter if it's a small data center, a medium, or a uh, really, you know, high HPC, large scale, you're going to save a lot of money in a data center when you put in container. Because you're going to separate that cold supply air from the hot uh, exhaust air, and only then can you start doing that cooling optimization. You're going to be able to say, I want 75 degrees supply air temperature getting to my IT equipment. So I'm going to set the supply air for my cooling units at 75. I can have confidence that's the temperature that they're going to get. And you're going to be in control of that because, again, you've separated the cold supply from the hot exhaust. Uh, just to summarize before I do a few question and answer, uh, I did a lot of math, a lot of calculations. If you go to our website, um, I've done a seven-in-one calculator suite. It's a free download. It's all in Excel. It goes through a lot of what we talked about today, um, but it does all the math for you. It actually does a lot more because it's seven calculators. 
Uh, you can see ROI saving, how much you uh, achieve by raising temperatures in the data center. Uh, unless you love the fan affinity more and want to you know, start doing cubed equations, this is going to do it for you. You'll put in a few numbers, you'll get those return to savings right there. Um, I just added a chiller efficiency calculator. Uh, you add your tonnage, your electricity, your leading water temperature, um, your new leading water temperature after installing containment will tell you how much you're going to save. Uh, I even touched real briefly on the CFM for pods, uh, depending on heat load. I've really automated that process in one of these calculators, but also left in a manual way to do it. Like I said, if it's something of interest to you, uh, please go to our website and download it. Last slide is we've got some white papers. If today's topic is something you're very interested in and want to get more into detail, um, the white paper is a free download. You don't have to give any information. Just go to our site, uh, 2018, Containment's Role in Energy Efficiency and Rapid ROI, uh, 15 pages of math and uh, a lot of uh, references to what we talked about today. Uh, 2019, Data Center Containment 101. Uh, what's really good about that white paper is if you're saying, do I go hot aisle, do I do cold? Um, we're going to give you two pages almost of scenarios to help you decide. Finally, uh, it's just been out there for a couple weeks now, Containment Helping Data Centers Go Green. It's our 2020 white paper. I want to thank everybody uh, for their time today. I've left a few minutes. Uh, Royce, maybe if you don't mind, you can unmute and I can answer anybody uh, question and answer. And of course, later, uh, feel free to co contact Royce, contact myself. My email is shown here. I'd be more than happy to discuss anything we've talked about today or answer any questions. Okay, Gordon, if you open up your chat, we have a question from Russ Johnson. Uh, can okay. you see, do you find that containment utilizing vertical exhaust ducts, aka cabinet chimneys, are as effective or more effective than in row coolers with hot aisle containment? Um, definitely more expensive uh, to build your cabinets that way. Uh, one, of the one of the challenges with chimneys, um, cabinets, is that hot air, pulling that air uh, vertically up without you know, just a passive device. Uh, sometimes they'll have to put fans in there to move that air out. Uh, but the hot aisle containment with in-row coolers is so simple because it, it takes all that, it takes air movement, uh, pushing that you know, air, do I need fans? It takes that all out of the equation. And again, the chimney, it's better than nothing. However, if you do hot or cold, you're doing something the chimney's not doing. You're fully separating the hot air from the cold air. Now, the exception, some people take chimneys all the way up to a drop ceiling. Again, you just got to make sure that air actually makes it all the way up to that drop ceiling and doesn't come back and settle into the equipment. Um, but no, we don't find it as cost effective and certainly not as efficient or as effective as just putting doors in a roof system on top uh, of a pod that has a road cooling. It just, um, it just works so good when we do it with the doors on the roof. Any other questions? With the, with the spike or the delta between where we're at today at 15 kW per rack in the standard data center going to 30, 50, do you see a dramatic shift in the TCO model um, as far as the savings being exponentially greater? Okay. Sense? So he said, with the, the way densities are increasing from say 15 to 30, are you seeing a, a big difference in the TCO? From, from, from raising your temperature. From, ra from raising the temperature. Yeah, the, the one thing, the good news about higher densities, and I kind of touched on this, but I didn't want to muddy the waters, confuse things. The good news about your 15K or your 20K rack is like I said, if you have a 20K rack or higher, you can make the assumption without even having a spec sheet that uh, you have a higher delta, you know, you've know, got a 40 degree delta across that rack if you're at 20K or higher, yet you have to have that large delta. So you need less air in that data center, which obviously less air lowers the TCO, 
of the data center, uh, but it doesn't affect the temperature. So you still want to be able to control that temperature. So the good news to what you're saying, the higher the servers, uh, the KW, uh, the less airflow you're going to need compared to what you may have thought a couple of years ago, uh, but you're still going to need containment in order to raise the temperatures. Otherwise, you're still going to be pumping out, you know, 55, 60, 65 degree temperature in the gas. Does that answer your question? Russ, I know you stepped out. He answered your question while you were out. Do you want to hear his response to your question? No, it wasn't my question. I was just feeling oh, okay. I had someone, but I did just send you a follow-up question okay. um, to that first question that asks, um, when would you recommend one over the other? So vertical exhaust with a crack versus containment. So when would you recommend uh, the vertical exhaust chimneys uh, versus uh, using containment. Would you ever would you ever recommend the chimney uh, over the containment? I, I guess if you had, um, I'm trying to think of an example. If you had one or two racks, you know, with a very high density, um, and you wanted to make sure you push that air up, you know, maybe to a drop ceiling or as high as possible uh, without that hot exhaust air. Uh, just coming out and affecting the neighboring cabinets or you know, rolling over to other portions of the data center. Um, that would be an example of where you know, I could go with one or two cabinet chimneys. Um, but again, if it's a case of I want to put cabinet chimneys on all 20, all 20 racks in, in this pod and this pod, um, it's not as cost effective um, and it's not, it's, you're, you're again, technically, unless you're pushing it to a drop ceiling, you're not really separating that air as well as you could be. So to kind of answer your question, would I ever say go with a chimney? Um, you know, that would be a case maybe I had one or two racks that I just wanted to keep that hot air away from uh, the, neighboring, the neighboring racks that weren't as hot. But even in, the, even in those cases, uh, I'd probably still look at doing some type of, you know, cold aisle containment or hot aisle containment uh, over the chimney because it just works now just for not one or two racks, but it works for the entire pot. So I, I'd like to know that the input temperature to that uh, 20K rack that maybe I'm thinking of putting in with the chimney is the same input temperature to that 5K rack right next to it that I'm not putting a chimney on. And the way I can really assure that is just doing containment over a chimney. But again, chimney, if I'm just wanting to go you know, on a one or two racks, a case-by-case -case basis, um, that's where they could be effective in the data center. Any other questions? Well, and, I'm, and I'm, I don't want to beat this horse to death, but I think maybe the distinction is it's a closed system with with a, um, a roof crack um, that's pulling hot air from the uh, from the ceiling, and so in the closed system, uh, a chimney on every rack to exhaust that hot air um, into the uh, above the ceiling space that then gets sucked into the room crack, so that you're just saving a little bit maybe of, of cost for crack versus inline cooling, but it seems like that it's it it may be a similar strategy just depending on where you're putting the cooling unit. Yeah, and if, if I understand that right, you're like, you are correct. Cabinets, chimneys, it is hot oil containment. So if you're talking about building that chimney on every rack up through a drop ceiling as compared to running containment all the way above the racks up to the ceiling and then just opening tiles on the drop ceiling, you're doing the same thing. So at that point, you're doing the exact same thing. Um, the only challenge that we've seen is when people do cabinet chimneys all the way, you know, again, in an entire pod, uh, depending on how high you're trying to go, as compared to just opening up the whole pod with hot oil containment and just opening up a bunch of panels, when they do it just through a chimney, say if that chimney's gotta go up, you know, seven, 10 feet, um, sometimes customers have had issues drawing that air 
up through those chimneys without some type of fan at the top of the chimney to draw that air up into the drop ceiling as compared to just a, you know, a bathtub, a hot aisle containing pod with open ceiling tiles at the top. Um, that's, plus the cost, I, you know, the cost would be just so much more doing cabinets uh, or chimneys on every rack versus uh, just bringing containment to the ceiling and opening some ceiling caps. Good? Yeah, thank you. Anything else? I think that's it, Gordon. Terry, Kobe, who do you no, I don't have any questions. Uh, I just wanted to remind everyone that Gordon had made a comment about if you want to get a copy of the presentation. We normally would do a, a questionnaire at the end of this, and you can put down any questions, you might, other questions you might have, or, or comments, or, or anything you'd like to see at our next, next AFCON meeting. But we're going to just email those out to everyone. I can send. I can go ahead and just send it to you guys. Right. Awesome. And then if y'all want to blast it out, you can. If anybody wants it. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Gordon. If you can hear me. Thank you, Gordon. Hey, thank, thank you for having me uh, again. Uh, I'm very jealous, Royce, of that lunch you described to me. Uh, I hope everybody enjoys it. <laughs> and uh, thanks very much, everybody, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. See you later, Bye now. I'm struggling with my kids.